Shira, so happy to have you on the show a second time. There are very few guests who come on twice, who are invited to be back on twice, and you are one of them. You are in the two-time club. Oh, <laughs> I'm so honored. Thank you for having me again. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, last time you were on the show, I believe it was about a year and a half ago. So tell us, what have you been up to? Yeah, gosh. So um, yeah, I think last time we were talking about my first book, Minimalista, um, that was really all about my toolkit for editing and organizing. And um, I basically decided it would be really fascinating to see how other professional organizers live and set up their homes and do life. So um, I have spent the past year and a half traveling the world with um, my trusty photographer and friend Vivian by my side. And um, I interviewed 25 professional organizers around the world and got to tour their homes um, and basically compiled everything I learned plus um, a really beautiful house tour for each expert into a new book called Organized Living. Well, I got an advanced copy of your book and I just must say thank you so much for putting this into the world because the sad fact remains that I can't, and I'm guessing many of my listeners can't, afford to hire a professional organizer. So you've given us a glimpse into how professional how professional organizers organize, yes, but also like tips and tricks for those of us who, again, can't hire a professional. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I'm so excited. Um, before we do that, though, let's just all get on the same page and let's really hone in on the why. Like, why should we care about making an organized home and maintaining it? What are the benefits that you've seen of an organized home? Totally. So I would say, you know, clutter and disorganization, really what I've seen is they prevent people from living the lives they want to live. Um, it can leave people feeling depressed, overwhelmed, anxious, even paralyzed. And conversely, when you have an organized home and I like to say a clutter-free life, um, it can lead to efficiency in all areas, right? So instead of spending time frantically searching for your wallet or keys before you get out the door. You can spend that time doing whatever it is you really want to be doing. Um, it leads to clarity and control. It leads to a sense of freedom. Um, I would say at the most basic level, I've seen that organization translates into calm. So when you walk into your home after a long day and everything is streamlined and organized, you can immediately relax and decompress instead of messing with the piles or feeling like your work is really never done. Um, so that's really how I think of it is it's a tool to feel calmer, freer, more efficient, more creative, all of the things that most of us are seeking. I love that. And I love your emphasis on the fact that organization and maintaining an organizing an organized home which again is work in and of itself though it's a tool like a tool does something for you it works for you and i think that's important for those of us listening who do not have personalities that um would be like organized like they organization is hard for them right it's a tool to help you find that peace, find that calm, um, find that more time, let's say. And so I guess I just, I wonder, what do you say though to those listeners who say, you know, I've spent time getting organized. I've tried to maintain the systems that I've enacted and I always fail because I'm just not an organized person by nature. Do you have any words for them? A hundred percent. So I want to debunk. I really think it's a myth that you're either born with the organized gene or you're kind of destined to be disorganized. I think that experience has shown me, um, you know, I've been in this industry almost 15 years and I have worked with three-year-olds and I've worked with 80-year-olds and I see that anyone at any age, at any phase of life can learn the skill of being organized and thinking like an organizer and I would say that the number one thing that I see is that people overcomplicate organization. So we make it too difficult to set up and to maintain. 
And, you know, I'm myself, I'm a busy working mom. I have two kids, a husband, a dog. I'm running a career. I'm writing books. And I have to make my organizational systems so simple that a five-year-old can maintain them. So I think, you know, there's a misconception that we have to have things color-coded or alphabetized to be organized. Organization is really as simple as grouping similar things together and having everything have a designated home. That's it. So I really want to drive that point home that even if you think, you know, I'm just not that person, I've never been able to organize, if my kids can do it with their Halloween candy, I promise that you can do it with your own home. It's just a matter of simplifying it. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. I mean, there are certainly personalities in this world that need the the organizational system, let's say the filing cabinet, organized, right? Like by date or by whatever. Um, that's not me. Like if it's if it's in the filing cabinet and the door is closed, I considered that organized. You're winning. Yes. <laughs> and I'll say, you know, I am a card carrying professional organizer. My file system is like eight huge categories, like kids, car, home. So I can literally just dump things and know they're in the right spot. I can find them when I need to. Right. But otherwise I know I'm not an alphabetical person. It's just going to be too much brain power and I'm not going to maintain it. So I think it is half of the battle is just knowing who, who you are and designing systems that will actually be maintainable and achievable for you. Hmm. And if I can just add to that, it's also about sticking with it. Like if you, if your home is an unorganized or disorganized, I believe the word is, if your home is a disorganized mess and you spend all this time on the upfront, like setting up the systems and then you don't maintain them, it's very likely that you'll feel like, oh, I put in all this effort and what was the point, right? But you, it's like with any new habit or new lifestyle change, you got to stick with it for a while, a couple months maybe a year to see the, to let, to let the benefits shine into your life. Um, like without the exercise, right? Like if you exercise for a week and then you're like, I still have this body, I'm still fatigued. I still can't go up the stairs. Like you gotta, you gotta keep doing it. It's the consistency. It is a hundred percent. I mean, you're right. Like anything, you could have the most brilliant system set up, but if you don't practice good habits, any system will fall flat. So I think it's figuring out ways to make it easy and to make it even, dare I say, fun. Um, you know, like when I had really young kids, my girls are teenagers now, everything was like, get it in the basket, right? Like we would have big open bins and big vessels where they could just literally dump their stuff um, when it was time to clean up. So instead of it feeling like this arduous task, it could be a game. So any opportunity you have to make things like a plop or a dump instead of a really meticulous system that's going to hurt your brain, I say like make it as easy and fun as you possibly can for yourself. Yeah. And when you feel those benefits that you aptly um, listed for us, like really revel in them. I remember when you were back here on the show the first time, we were talking about entryways and you had made a point that, you know, many of us who have dogs, we need our dog leash in the entryway, but dog leashes and poop bags are not attractive. So why not put them in a basket and then hang the basket on the hook? Easy. Like how easy is that? And so I actually did that because I have a dog and my dog leash is not cute. And so now when I look at the basket that contains the ball, the leash, the poop bags and whatever else, whatever else dog paraphernalia I have, I take a minute and I think to myself, this is so nice. It's organized and it's, and it's aesthetically pleasing. Like let's bask in that for a minute. So I say all that to the disorganized people listening. Like when you feel and experience a benefit of being organized, like allow it, allow that to wash over you because that will inform your future decisions. I, I could not agree more. And I think so much of my work is just about tiny wins and having those tiny wins compound. So instead of feeling like you have to organize your entire home to be successful, 
you could literally set up one mini system like you did. Like, I'm going to throw my dog stuff in a basket and now I've organized something. Or I'm going to knock out a single drawer that drives me crazy that I don't like seeing every morning. Like, you know, my bathroom drawer or my junk drawer. It's those little tiny things that then send a message to your brain. I am capable of being an organized person. I do have the skills to do this. Well, Shira, you have so many tips in your new book, Organized Living, and we're just going to talk about a couple of them today, like what professional organizers do when they come into a home, what they do in their own homes. And you have a, um, a phrase, a saying in your book that stopped me dead in my tracks. And I think it's going to do the same for all the minimalists listening. And the quote is, don't shop for a mansion if you live in a cottage. Mic drop. What does this mean and how do professional organizers use this saying in the organizing world? Yes. Well, I first have to give credit to the organizer who told me that saying. Um, So Ryan from Home and Sort, who's also an organizer based in California, said that to me. And it also struck me that like, yes, this is the problem that so many people have is this sense of shopping for the home that they really don't have instead of embracing their circumstances and working to better or elevate what they've got. So, you know, as a card carrying minimalist myself in a small home, you know, I have to stop myself when I see like, say a massive sectional that I love, but I'm like, where does that actually go in my tiny bungalow? It's not practical. It doesn't make sense, right? So I think it's kind of a practice of learning how to appreciate things without necessarily buying them or bringing them into your home. And before you make the decision to pull the trigger on buying something, to actually look around at your environment and say, does this have a place? Does this make sense? Do I already have something that does the same thing or has the same functionality? Um, And it's just about intentionality and really thinking about what are my given circumstances and how can I do the best that I can with those instead of living in this kind of dream world of, you know, living in a castle when really you're in a studio. Yeah. Your answer there makes me think about an article I just read. I'll link to it in the show notes, listeners. Um, It was in the Washington Post and it was detailing a new study that came out and it basically looked at people who watched a lot of HDTV. And they found that the people who watch a lot of HDTV uh, have ideas about their own homes, that their own homes are boring. That's a quote from the study. And it watching too much HDTV makes them, quote, sad. And so I think that relates to your answer there in that um, you can appreciate a big sectional. You can appreciate what they're doing on HGTV without having to then take the extra step of saying like, oh, I need this or I need that kitchen on HGTV or I need this sectional, right? You can appreciate from afar. Is that what you're saying? Totally. And I think like I have this funny little hobby I call browsing without buying where I will go to, you know, I love style and I love design. I don't actually love shopping, but I love getting inspiration. So I will go to a boutique and I will see beautiful clothes and I'll go back to my closet and see how can I curate an outfit that's like what I just saw but without buying a thing, right? And likewise with like a home decor, like maybe I see the big sectional and I think, what is it that I love about that? Is it how comfortable it is? Is it the color? Maybe I can add some throw pillows to my existing couch to make it cozier and more comfy. But I think there's a way of feeling abundant without buying or accumulating more things. Um, And that practice has been so kind of liberating for me to feel like I don't have to buy a thing to be able to switch up my home, elevate my space. So much of that is just getting creative, playing around with new pairings. Often it's just subtraction instead of addition. Um, As I'm sure you know, like I think the best way to elevate your space is simply by having less clutter in your space, which is free and available to everyone at every time. So it's just, yeah, it's that idea of like, 
observing what's the thing that I'm envious or that, you know, on these shows that I like or that I feel like I can't have and how can I get creative and scrappy and create them for myself? Yeah. I think that in our culture, we've forgotten that we can like and be inspired by items. We do not have to own them and bring them into our homes. We for, we forget that because so many of us have excess money burning holes in our pockets. And so we think we need, we can just need to buy it and bring it in and then we'll have the HGTV home. But the fact remains, and I know this from your book because the photos in your book, by the way, are just so awe inspiring. The professional organizers are not buying every beautiful thing they find and bringing it into their own homes. And they're not bringing it into, they're not bringing this stuff into their clients' homes either. They know how to use it for inspiration as opposed to bringing it in and, you know, creating clutter. Because when we buy all the things that inspire us, what we're really just doing is making clutter. The photos in your book are like gorgeous because of the fact that everything in there is placed with intention. It's not about taking everything in. So let's go back to another part of your book that really um, changed my life. And that is the display and conceal rule. Talk me through it. Yes. So one of the things that I noticed, you know, in these 25 homes was this common thread of we all own those like utility items that are not easy on the eyes, like charging cords or batteries or light bulbs or our kids' diapers, right? Like we all have to own the things that aren't lovely to look at. But I think what I noticed is that the thing that professional organizers do differently is they tuck all of those things in their concealed storage. So whether that's a drawer or a cabinet, anything with a closed door so that you're not visually seeing it. And they display on the open shelving and the open spaces in their homes, the beautiful things. So, and even in a kitchen, like you could think that your coffee mugs are beautiful, right? It doesn't need to be a work of art. It's just a matter of being intentional about what are the things that I showcase in my home that I'm going to see all the time and what are the things that I need to have, like maybe it's like your coffee filters you don't want to have on display, but maybe you have a beautiful coffee maker and beautiful coffee mugs, so you have those out on your open shelves. But it's just being really mindful about what are the things that I want to see every day at my home, what are the things I need to own that I can tuck away. Yeah. I'm thinking back to HGTV again, right? Like open shelving in the kitchen is all the rage. They're not sticking their boxes of crackers and granola bars on those shelves. They're putting their really beautiful dishes, which are art display display pieces uh, in their own right. They're also functional. This isn't rocket science, but I don't fit. I don't know that people think about it, right? When we're, when we're deciding what to display, display the pretty stuff, display your mugs, don't display the coffee pods (laughs) or display the basket and not the dog leash, like not rocket science, but most of us are so caught up in the day to day that we don't even, you know, think about that. So thank you. Totally. Yes. Yeah. And I think sometimes it's just opening up the awareness to look around your home as if you were a guest in it. And just noticing, oh, why is that there? I don't even know. I didn't even think about it. But now I can conceal it and not stare at it every day. So yeah, it's just increasing the awareness. Yes, because also too, when you live in a space and the same thing is you're looking at the same stuff every day, you no longer see it. So saying it now makes us then go back into our own homes and see it. (laughs) So let's talk about the product packaging because it's ugly. Um, How does ditching the product packaging, which I see all the time on HGTV, we get rid of the packaging and then suddenly everything is better. But like, how does that translate into a space that's more aesthetically pleasing and calm and et cetera? Yeah. So I think, I mean, Of course, there's the sustainability point of all of this, which I know so much of your work revolves around is just 
as much as we can limit product packaging and plastic from coming into our home, the better. But I think, you know, most of us do have to buy some products that come in plastic or cardboard or have labels, right? And so all of those things create a form of visual clutter. And everything in our home, our brain needs to process as visual information. So the more you can strip away that packaging, the labeling, the logos, um, and create cohesive storage, it will be soothing and pleasing to the brain. Um, and most organizers, you know, have this decant rule. So anything that can be decanted gets decanted, even if that's like unwrapping your batteries and putting them in a little bamboo drawer organizer, as opposed to just having a plastic, you know, container of batteries. Um, as much as we can strip away that visual clutter, the better. And I do want to point out, you know, I'm lucky I live in Berkeley, which is kind of the height of sustainable living. So I've got lots of options to shop from refill stores or bulk bins and really prevent packaging from coming into my home. But I've worked with clients all over the country, many of whom don't have those resources. And so I just say as much as possible, if you can bring your own bags or your own containers when you are shopping and see how much of that you can eliminate in the first place, um, you know, always for the good, for the environment. And then once you're home and you have whatever you have in terms of packaging, the first thing every organizer does is they just rip off the plastic, rip off the, you know, cardboard, ditch all packaging and Ideally, you're decanting into something that's also sustainably made, like a glass container or, you know, I've mentioned bamboo uh, drawer organizers, but avoiding more plastic, more labels, more packaging. So I thank you for mentioning the see what you can buy without packaging to begin with. So we're not just ripping it off and throwing it in the trash. I appreciate you mentioning that. I do have a question, though, with regard to you mentioned batteries, let's say, like, do you, so, so for me, batteries go in a drawer and I, again, I mentioned at the outset, I don't really care what's happening <laughs> in the drawers as long as it's out of my sight. Is, is there a benefit in your opinion to taking off the battery packaging and putting it in a bamboo, whatever drawer organizer that you purchased? Like, is there, um, a significant benefit or is the benefit to your health and wellness and well-being negligible in your opinion? So this is such a good question. And I think the answer is it's different for everyone, right? Like I am a person who's so sensitive to my environment that if I open a drawer and the batteries are out of packaging and lined up in a nice row in a bamboo drawer organizer, it honestly boosts my mood and makes me happy. There are so many other people who are like, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard, including my husband, right? He just doesn't care. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be a game changer for him. And so I never want to put pressure on people to do organizing in a prescriptive way, because the truth is organizing is about optimizing your life. And everyone has a different idea of what that means. So if you can dump all your batteries in a drawer, close the drawer, know where your batteries are and sleep well at night, kudos. Like there is no reason to purchase any products. But so many of my clients come to me because they say, I'm really sensitive to my environment. I look at these pictures and I want it, but I don't know how to get it. If you're especially sensitive to things like that, then there are all of these easy hacks like, simply removing the packaging of your batteries. And you don't have to go buy anything. You could use an iPhone box, which is super sturdy and resilient, right? And you don't have to spend a dime, but you can repurpose things like a Tupperware container or an iPhone box to create your own drawer dividers, ditch the packaging and get a streamlined look. Got it. I appreciate that answer. Um, and I think it does depend on the person, right? Um, I will say, as somebody who says I don't care about my batteries and packages, the leash in the basket has really improved my life. So maybe you got to try it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is about customizing. And, you know, when I when I first meet with an organizing client, I will say to them, like, 
what are you after? Are you wanting like a Pinterest perfect pantry or are you wanting to be able to find your cereal? And people can usually self-identify and there's no judgment either way, right? It's about determining what's the thing that you want that will feel best for you. And, you know, often because I live in the San Francisco Bay Area and people are really more driven by sustainability um, than anything else, buying products to put things in when you don't need to, you know, is not optimal for many of my clients. So it's really about asking yourself those questions. What do I need? What do I crave? What's going to optimize and simplify my life? Well, there's... Um, little videos. I can't, I'm so not social media savvy, but what are they called? Reels? <laughs> there are so many reels on the internet of people unpackaging their stuff in their pantry and putting it in their pantry. And, and it's like a before and after. And I watch them because they're fun. Um, I'm wondering if there are any benefits to ditching the product packaging when it comes to food. Like, does the cereal lasts longer when it's in a more durable container? Do the nuts not go stale? Like, do you have anything to say on that? Like, are there any benefits other than like, it looks pretty? Yeah, like a thousand percent. And I can tell you from organizing hundreds of homes, like the most depressing thing I see is the volume of food waste in overflowing pantries where people just have simply lost track of what they own and things are crumpled up and half opened and expired and stale. And so by investing in one set of airtight canisters, I prefer a glass airtight canister for my pantry. I have found that we can put everything from like crackers, nuts, snack foods, baking goods, into these jars and they will last months and months longer than just in say a cardboard box in a plastic bag like your cereal. So certainly in terms of the shelf life, it's like without a doubt. But the other thing is that when you decant things into clear vessels, you can see at a glance what you have, which will prevent you from overbuying. So now, you know, in my pantry, I've basically decanted like all of our basic pantry staples into these glass jars. So before I go shopping, I go grocery shopping once a week. All I have to do is open the doors to my pantry and I can eyeball and see what's empty instead of tearing through an entire pantry, right? And opening every box and opening every basket. You can see at a glance and then you can prevent food waste, overbuying, um, buying things you already have. So for me, it has been like the most sustainable move probably in my entire house is just that one thing of investing in one set of jars. And you can use mason jars or jars you already have. Um, for me, of course, I like them to be matching, but it was like a one-time investment 10 years ago um, that I kind of did an inventory of what are the things our family always eats and I made my categories very broad. So instead of like wheat thins, crackers, or instead of almonds, nuts, so that as we want to change what we're eating or snacking on, we can still dump into the same vessel without having to relabel. Okay. <laughs> okay. You've convinced me just for the fact of not wasting food alone. I mean, if you think about food, food packaging, it's there to ensure that the food is um, fresh when it gets to our house. The company no longer cares. The corporation no longer cares what happens once it's in our house, if it goes stale. And so I hear what you're saying there. I mean, for me, Personally, like I love the mason jars, especially for snackables, like nuts is a big one. You just stick it in a wide mouth mason jar. I can see it. I can see when we're low without me having to open everything and shake it. But this is a very practical question, Shira. This is like, <laughs> are you ready? So let's talk about cereal. Let's say you buy, I don't know, some sort of flakes. We'll call it sustainable, sustainable minimalist flakes. We're just making up a cereal. And everybody loves it in your house. You buy it every week. 
that you see that you still have a third of sustainable minimalist flakes in your clear container. What do you do with the new box? Do you put it on top? Like, what do you do? <laughs> okay. I've got an answer. I feel like this is actually one of my most asked questions. What do you do with the leftover bits, right? If you're decanting. So you either eat them. If it's like a little bit, like as I'm decanting, if there's like a handful of something, I will pop it in my mouth. Not always the best solution. If you have a third of, you know, or a sizable amount, you ditch the box. So say it's cereal, you'll ditch the box. Now you already have like a much smaller thing. You roll it up and use like a little chip clip or a binder clip, anything that you have. And I just tuck it behind that vessel so that I can refill from it. Or if you find yourself decanting and you have a number of these things, I usually make a backup bin or like a restock bin in my pantry. So you could just use, I mean, literally a shoebox, a bin, a basket, any type of vessel. And then you just stock those things out of the big bulky boxes. But you would just take if it was like, you know, a box of crackers and you have, I don't know, 20 crackers left, right? You ditch the box, recycle the box, roll up the packaging and put a clip on it. And now you have like your backup bin so you can decant. Or I often send those with my kids to school or for snacks so that they get eaten. And if you have a little bit left, you're going to like want to get rid of it. So you're going to push it on your family so that you can refill. All right. One more question about the pantry before we move on. And that is this. Do you, is there anything you don't decant? Is there anything that you leave in its original packaging? Yes. So, you know, if I buy, I try to prevent buying like single use packaged goods, like granola bars or fruit leathers, but certainly my kids enjoy those things. So anything like that, I find it a little more silly to, you know, have a jar full of individually wrapped goodies. So we have in our pantry, I just call it the snack bin. And anything like that that's kind of loose or random, we just toss in. Um, or, you know, what I found next to impossible to, to decant is tortilla chips, right? They're big and they are they just don't fit nicely into a jar. So tortilla chips go in my snack bin with a chip clip. And, you know, they just need to get eaten. They won't stay as fresh as if they were in um, an airtight jar. But I have yet to find an airtight jar that can house an entire bag of tortilla chips. So things like that. Anything like bulky or cumbersome or individually wrapped, I wouldn't decant. All right. So I'm, I'm on board. I'm going to do this. I will report back listeners. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. I'm all for uh, reducing food waste because I feel like stuff gets lost. Just like it gets lost in the fridge, it gets lost in the pantry. And who wants to spend more money <laughs> replacing stuff that we already have we just forgot about? Right. And you don't have to have an entire supermarket in your home. I think people forget that. And I think, honestly, in the post-COVID world, there is a greater sense of scarcity around food and paper goods and kind of, you know, stocking up on all of that just in case. But I can tell you, like, even through the worst part of the pandemic, like, we had, like, a handful of rolls of toilet paper and, like, we were okay. <laughs> So I think it's getting out of that mentality of like, I've got to, you know, get everything around me for comfort and trusting that there will be enough that you can find what you need, that, you know, stores will always be replenishing and you just don't need to have a thousand bags of chips. <laughs> you know, you can have one. Hopefully the pandemic, this pandemic is in our rear view mirror. And we can also leave these habits that we adopted during the pandemic, like buying an awful lot and hoarding stuff and filling our homes full of stuff. Um, hopefully we can leave that in the rear view mirror as well. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, no, I really do. And I'm not trying to advise people on, you know, not doing what they think is best for their family. But I do just want to say, you know, when when that was happening and people were kind of, in my opinion, really overbuying and overstocking up, 
it took away resources from people that then couldn't find those things. And so I think it's almost, I feel like a responsibility for all of us to just buy what we need because then there will be enough resources to go around. All right, so before we say goodbye, Shira, I have one more question that I need your insight on. And that is with regard to the neglected spaces in our homes. What are the traditionally neglected spaces that most of us have and how can we elevate them? Yeah, so I would say, you know, one of the things, you know, traveling around and meeting all of these organizers and getting to poke around their their homes and be super nosy is some of the areas that really surprised me that I thought even in my own home I've never paid attention to were under the kitchen sink. Like that's typically an area that's really neglected because nobody sees it. And we just kind of like shove our cleaning products or sponges or gloves or, you know, old random things. And some of these organizers who you'll see in the book literally made it like a work of art under their sink. And I just thought, how lovely to elevate something as mundane as doing the dishes or cleaning up and kind of treat yourself to a beautifully curated space where you just have what you need and it's organized and it's lovely and it's not piled or dumped in a haphazard way. So I would say under the kitchen sink was a big one. Um, Under the bathroom sink or the medicine cabinet is another one where there's a lot of dumping and shoving where you just think, who cares? No one's going to see it. But the truth is you're going to see it and you're an important person. And so I think looking at and questioning what are the areas that I engage with every day that irrespective of if anyone else comes over and sees it, you know, I assume most people aren't snooping through your drawers, (laughs) But just for you, just for your own well-being and mental health to wake up and have a beautiful nightstand that doesn't have trash or old coffee mugs or yesterday's mail on it. um, Those are some of the spaces that I always love to help people elevate because it feels like a treat and a form of self-care and I think really perpetuates the notion that like you're important, your home is important. And it's an easy way to boost your mental health without spending a lot of time or money. I love that because we're worthy and we are we deserve those little spaces just for us, even if nobody's going to see them. Something that I talk about a lot on this show is, you know, the external living versus the internal living. And so for me, generally... It started out as having a minimalist organized home was about other people so that other people came over and um, my house was, you know, pristine and nice and I didn't have to run around cleaning up my home when I had people over. And so I'm thinking I'm saying this all out loud because I'm thinking about how, you know, traditionally I don't care what's going on under the sink because nobody's going to see it. But you're right. I'm going to see it. So it's not about making a home organized and uh, minimalist or whatever adjective we want to use for other people. It's for, it's for the liver. It's for me. And I think that's a really powerful shift um, because it's not about externally living to impress other people. It's about making our lives better, improving our own day-to-day life. And so I'm going to think about that what little spaces in my home do I use every day that I can tidy up and organize just for me, even if nobody else sees it? Not my kids, not my husband, not my dog, just me. I love that. I'm so glad. Yeah, I think it's like a little treat you can give yourself. You know, when you open up your nightstand drawer and you just have your journal and your favorite pen or, you know, the book that you're loving or reading, it's like nobody else, it's not for anybody else, it's for you. So I think I want to prompt your listeners to do the same, to kind of think about what's one tiny space. It could even be as micro as like your purse or your wallet, and just making that more lovely to look at and intentional. But it has nothing to do with anyone else. It it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. It's really about treating yourself with that care and that mindfulness. Yeah, it's self-care. Absolutely. 
Shira, tell us about Organized Living. It comes out on October 3rd. What else can we find in it? Where can we find it? Give us all the details. Yes. So Organized Living features the actual home tours, um, uncut and unfiltered, (laughs) of 25 professional organizers from around the globe, um, including all across the U.S. and Canada, Mexico City, Paris, Lisbon, Stockholm, London. I hope I'm not missing anything. Um, And to me, the most exciting part of this book is that I featured everything from an Airstream trailer, a woman and her husband who have downsized to live in an Airstream trailer. I have multiple people in 200 square feet or 300 square feet apartments. Um, I also have huge families living in large, sprawling suburban homes. So the book really has something for everyone. And my goal was to pair visual inspiration and kind of fun organizing eye candy with really practical, actionable tips for your home that you can use whether you live in a tiny studio or a mansion. Um, So that's the goal is something for everyone and real practical tips um, that you can use whether you're in a tiny space or a huge space, whether you're a minimalist or a maximalist or anything in between. Well, just bringing this back to kind of where we started and I was talking about HGTV and et cetera. I love that your book marries the eye candy inspiration with the practical tips so that we can bring those ideas and inspiration into whatever we live in, whether it's the cottage, whether it's the (laughs) tiny home, whatever it is, there's something for everybody. Thank you so much, Shira, for coming on the show a second time. We're going to have to make it a third when your next book comes out. (laughs) Oh, yay. (laughs) Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure. And always, I could talk to you all day.